Well, good morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous. My name is Ted Rieken, and I'm the Dean of Education here at the University of Victoria. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here, not only to the University of Victoria, but to Congress 2013. We acknowledge with respect the history, customs, and culture of the Coast Salish and Strait Salish peoples on whose traditional lands our university resides. This year, from September uh, 2012 to June 2013, UVic has been celebrating its 50th anniversary, and Congress is part of marking this milestone. UVic has a long and distinguished educational record, starting as Victoria College in 1903, when first and second year arts and science courses from Montreal's McGill University were offered. And then in 1920, Victoria College became affiliated with the University of British Columbia. Now, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of our university status which took, a took effect July 1st, 1963. The anniversary period has been full of events and historical reflections, now culminating in Congress, at which we host colleagues from across the country and from our local community to join in our celebration. The theme of Congress this year is At the Edge, which not only reflects UVic's location on the west coast of Canada, but is also about testing the boundaries of disciplines, promoting innovative thinking, seeking relevance to both local and global communities, and committing to engaged scholarship and knowledge mobilization. Our theme focuses on the key social challenges of, of inequality, the need for inclusivity, and the acceptance of diversity to ensure voices on the margins are heard. Today's big thinking event is about those who are not just at the edge, but at the beginning of their lifelong journeys as learners, as family members, and as members of society. Here to help us explore this theme is Margaret McCain. And to introduce you to Mrs. McCain, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Dr. Ann Sherman, Dean of Education at the University of New Brunswick. Dr. Sherman is here representing the Association of Canadian Deans of Education, who are co-sponsors of this big thinking event, along with the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences. So once again, welcome. We look forward to Mrs. McCain's talk and the launch of the Accord on Early Learning this afternoon. And now, Dr. Sherman. Thank you, Ted. And it's a, a real honor and pleasure uh, to introduce to you to the Honorable Margaret McCain. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to know Margie since I was a little girl, and uh, she is someone who has been uh, a, a role model, a mentor, uh, and someone uh, who I admire greatly for her work in early childhood policy development and other uh, women and children's issues. Uh, Margie was born in Nova Scotia, uh, lived for a long time in New Brunswick, uh, was the first female Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick from 1994 to 1997. Uh, she worked with Fraser Mustard on the very first early year study back in 1998. Uh, and so that's been a 15 year involvement for her. And some of the work that she'll share today uh, comes from the most recent early year study uh, just released in the last year. Margie is one of those philanthropists who takes her work seriously. Uh, she is the best educated philanthropist, in my opinion, because she actually participates in research about the areas she's considering uh, funding. And she has been a huge support across Canada for early learning centers uh, who are developing uh, programs that are most appropriate for children of that age group. Uh, I really appreciate her support of a universal approach to early childhood education where all children should have the opportunity uh, to participate in programs that are appropriate for them. Uh, Margie is currently the chair of the Margaret and Wallace Family Foundation. She also serves on the board of the Canadian Women's Foundation and the Canadian Institute for Child Study. And she truly is someone who is knowledgeable about our need in Canada to promote early learning. So please join me in welcoming the Honorable Margaret Norrie McCain.
Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to look out and see a few familiar faces. I do thank you for inviting me to take part in this conference, and most heartily thank you for putting early learning on your agenda. Nowhere is this is there a more important gathering than this conference. Your contribution helps minds to soar. The latest edition of the Early Year Study is the result of a collaborative effort between eight foundations from across Canada. We came together around a cause that is fundamentally progressive, a game changer, to make early education available to all children from age two. Early education for all would be publicly funded, available, top quality, and voluntary. And parents would decide if and how often their children attend. Earlier, study three builds on two other studies I co-chaired with the late Dr. Fraser Mustard. The first earlier study, uh, from 1999 revealed how experiences in early childhood from conception on shape the architecture and function of the brain with lifelong consequences for the individual and for society. It changed perceptions of how the first years of human development were viewed and recruited new advocates from health, finance, and science. In earlier study two, Fraser and I were joined by Dr. Stuart Shanker to argue for a comprehensive policy framework to improve population health outcomes. In earlier study three, this time we were joined with Carrie McQuaig, and we updated the social, economic, and scientific rationale for investing in early childhood education. This edition introduces the Early Childhood Education Report a tool for monitoring progress in the funding, policy, quality, and access to early education across Canada. And as we will discuss later, the report has already become a tool for policymakers to guide their progress. The evidence now is overwhelming. Good education, begun early, can improve every child's chance of success. It is fair. It works, it is affordable, it enjoys widespread popularity, and we are already on our way in Canada to making it a reality. We, of course, began our study by looking at families. The Canadian family is changing. It is smaller and more diverse, and the parents are older. Today's first-time mother is now likely to be 29, and the average family has only one child. Although parents are older and families are smaller, they are also poorer. Just having a child puts a family at risk of poverty. We compare some of the Nordic countries with Canada, the UK, and the United States. A robust policy package keeps family poverty low in the Nordic countries. Not so in Canada, where just having a child puts a family at risk. Lone parent status has no effect in the Nordic countries but is a major risk factor for poverty in the Anglo-American states. But senior poverty is different. Canada is a world leader in eliminating poverty among seniors. Focused efforts by governments at all levels have been highly successful, and a similar approach is needed to support the well-being of families with children. The biggest change for families in the is the growing presence of mothers in the workforce. Canadian women have a high level of participation in paid work, about 10 points higher than their counterparts in Europe. The financial well-being of families is highly dependent on the income of working mothers. The rate of poverty in one-income households is 21%, but drops to 4% for two-income holders. The reality is Canada couldn't function without mothers' employment. A study by the Vanier Institute estimates 35 billion in tax revenues would disappear annually if mothers stayed at home. Extensive research from many perspectives concurs that early human development is an intricate dance between nature and nurture, genes and the environment. Genes listen to the environment 
and the environment adapts the genetic blueprint. This is the important epigenetic story. In early life, nurturing, stimulation, and nutrition interact with genetic predispositions to sculpt the architecture of the brain and its neural pathways, influencing learning, behavior, and physical and mental health for life. The young child's brain is acutely vulnerable to its environment. If the early experiences are fear and stress, especially if these are overwhelming and occur repeatedly, then these neurochemical responses become the primary architects of the brain. Trauma scrambles the neurotransmitter signals that play key roles in telling growing neurons where to go and what to connect to. Children exposed to chronic and unpredictable stress, including harsh and chaotic parenting, witnessing the abuse of other family members, or the constant fighting between parents, will suffer deficits in their ability to learn. IQ will be lower in itself another risk factor for conduct problems and mental illness. Adversity in early childhood manifests itself almost immediately as aggression or withdrawal in preschoolers. Poor academic performance and greater school dropout rates, pregnancy, risky behavior, substance abuse, and mental health problems are seen in adolescents and young adults. Obesity and type two diabetes Cancers and heart disease manifest during the middle years. Early onset dementia plagues seniors. All these conditions come with substantial costs. It is clear that failing children during their early years is very, very expensive. <clears throat> An analysis was done by the Canadian Council on Learning. Unfortunately, this organization no longer exists, leaving a great gap in the public discourse on lifelong learning. But in 2008, the council pegged the annual public cost of one high school dropout at $7,500 annually. This figure is derived from a combination of lost tax revenue and increased spending on unemployment insurance and social assistance, in addition to greater costs to the criminal justice system. The price paid by the individual is even higher, totaling $11,500 in diminished health and income, and the annual public cost for a cohort of early school leavers is $2.62 billion. The lifetime cost is $18 billion. Many factors influence outcomes for children. The child's health is primary, followed by the home environment, including the socioeconomic status of the family, the educational attainment of the parents, and the family's income. Preschool and primary school are important outside influencers. It is difficult to intervene to influence family dynamics. But early education, however, has a long and proven track record in reducing vulnerabilities in children and breaking intergenerational cycles of illiteracy and poverty. When we say getting under the skin to change trajectories, results from a large ongoing study in the UK and Northern Ireland provide a good illustration. Edward Melwish and his team studied changes in children's numeracy knowledge from age three through to grade six. Some children started out poorly and continued to perform below expectations. Others started out well and continued to do so. Still others had a good start, but their performance declined. Others were below expectations when first assessed, but showed marked improvement. What do you notice about the movement in this graph? Yes, it all takes place before children reach formal schooling. We thought Dr. Melrose's work was so important that we recently brought him to Canada to meet with officials in Ontario and Atlantic Canada. To influence educational achievement, both the quality of early education and the amount of time children attend preschool are important. The UK study found developmental benefits even for children who had attended lower quality programs. This is the advantage that children derive just from being around other children. But the children who profited most attended good programs for two or more years. So duration is also a factor. 15 hours a week appears to be the tipping point. 
Based on the research, it would appear that provinces providing full-day kindergarten are ahead of those offering part-time. Those offering programming for two or three years before grade one are ahead of those offering one year. Research tells us that emotional and cognitive self-regulation has the same neural roots. Self-regulation reflects the state of our limbic system and its ability to attend to tasks, to focus, to learn. Self-regulation may be far more important than IQ in determining not only what kind of grades a child earns, but how often she goes to class, how much time she spends on homework, how vulnerable she is to risky behavior, even things as simple as how much time she spends watching TV or playing video games. Self-regulation is often misinterpreted as behavior management. It is not about regulating the child. It is about the child's abil ability to regulate her own behavior. While all early education programs appear to provide a social boost, good early education has enduring effects on self-regulation. This is supported by research out of the University of British Columbia linking vulnerability in kindergarten with poor performances on provincial testing in grades four and seven. Manitoba research links vulnerability in kindergarten with poor academic results in grades 10 and 12, an indication of the lasting effects of early childhood experiences. Educators are the key to quality in early childhood settings. The accord by the Canadian Deans of Education to be launched later today identifies critical features of quality preschool. The quality of the adult child verbal interaction, knowledge and understanding of curriculum, knowledge of how young children learn, adults skilled in helping children resolve conflicts, and helping parents to support children's learning at home. Social class and parents' educational attainment does influence literacy outcomes. There is a gradient in reading competencies between children from lower income and affluent families. Preschool raises the bar for all children, but for children from disadvantaged families, it can be a life changer. Vocabulary skills in preschool are closely related to later academic competency. Language is a telling indicator since it provides the foundation for conceptual thinking. As we have seen in other competencies, children from low-income families are more likely to experience, experience language delays, but income is not determinist. Most low-income children are doing just fine, and many are excelling. Good parenting and good preschool can inoculate children from the effects of low income. But it is not only children from low-income families who are having problems. Note that the vulnerability gap between children from moderate and, and affluent families is just as large as the gap between middle class and poor families. Because children from low-income families are more likely to experience difficulties, it is often assumed that scarce resources should be directed to them. But although the percentage of children with delayed vocabulary is indeed more prevalent in low-income families, poor children form a relatively small group in the overall number of children having difficulty. Based on the findings from the National Longitudinal Survey on Children and Youth, we see that more than twice as many children who do not live in poor families have language delays. And this would indicate that changing outcomes at a population level requires a universal approach to early education. Low literacy levels create problems well beyond the classroom. Literacy skills are essential to participation in a democratic, pluralistic society. It is difficult for citizens to participate in decision making without the skills necessary to understand the complex issues. Analyses of the International Adult Literacy and Life Skills Survey conducted by Stats Canada in partnership with the OECD, suggests that the higher the literacy level, the more likely it is that the respondent will engage in various forms of civic activities. Low literacy levels are dangerous, particularly during times of social and economic instability. Illiteracy can leave people vulnerable to the simplistic solutions 
offered by extremist groups. Another advantage of early education is its high economic return. It is a job creator in its own right, while it supports parents to work. It provides immediate to long-term social and health savings as it prepares the next generation of workers. We see many signs for the federal government's economic action plan. More of them should be on schools. Robert Fairholm's work reveals childcare and education as the biggest job creators, almost twice as effective as stimulus spending on construction. The tax revenue generated from public spending on early education sends back about 90 cents in taxes to federal and provincial governments for every dollar invested. But the big story, the big economic story, is from Quebec and its real life experiment in providing low cost early education and care. Some policymakers have been scared off early education, pointing to Quebec as an example of a program out of control. But a recent study by a group of economists from the University of Sherbrooke tells a different story. Between 2000 and 2008, 70,000 more Quebec mothers entered the workforce because of low cost childcare. These are mothers who would have been unable to work without this support. And they pay 1.5 billion in taxes and draw 340 million less in social transfers, boosting Quebec's GDP by 5 billion. Quebec mothers have moved Quebec from the bottom to the top in female labor force participation in Canada. They have halved child poverty rates in their province. They have halved the number of lone parent families on social assistance. They have boosted fertility. More Quebec moms are having their second, third, and more children. Meanwhile, Quebec student test scores have moved from below to above the national average. When early education is organized so that it also supports parents' labor force participation, it more than pays for itself. The economists have found that for every dollar Quebec spends on early education and care, it collects $1.05 in increased taxes and reduced family payments, while the federal government gets 44 cents and haven't invested a penny. This is a very important study. These are real numbers based on real experiences, not a simulated economic model. Unfortunately, the policy framework for early childhood is still very fragmented. At both federal and provincial levels, several departments claim responsibility for some aspects of early childhood programming, but rarely is there a lead ministry. This schism is replicated at the local level. Split governance, legislation, funding, and delivery structures make it challenging to deliver effective programs. And while there are great organizations doing great things for kids, they accommodate only a few fortunate children. Parents are left to the service chaos. Navigating the quagmire is difficult for families with resources and almost impossible for disadvantaged families. A comprehensive multi-year review of 20 early childhood services systems conducted by the OECD concludes that jurisdiction, jurisdictions which split oversight for their preschool, childcare, and education services have weaker services, less access, poorer quality, less accountability. Research in Canada and abroad, including Better Beginnings, Better Futures, Toronto First Duty, findings from the Atlantic Early Childhood Development Centers, Sure Start in the UK, and Australia's Doveton examples, tells us that integrated early childhood services delivered from the school's platform are more effective, particularly when it comes to reaching hard to serve families. Many jurisdictions are now taking steps to reduce the adverse effects of split systems by merging their early education, childcare, and family support frameworks. Integrating systems takes high level political commitment. It takes stakeholder buy-in, the need to align programs with older children, and adequate funding. A vision is required which reconciles early education as a child development program that also supports parents' participation in the workplace. It needs to address the whole child and family to smooth transitions as children and families grow and change. It recognizes the importance of a trained and resourced 
early childhood workforce, and a curriculum grounded in children's natural exuberance for learning. It respects parents as their children's first and most important teachers and removes barriers to access with free or low cost programs. The provinces and territories have heard the message and are responding. More provinces are merging their early childhood and early intervention services into their departments of education. In 2006, no jurisdiction had merged departments, but today, five of them have. Schools are playing a greater role in early education. Half the provinces and territories now offer full day kindergarten, and more schools are directly delivering pre-K programs. In developing the first early year studies, we met kindergarten teachers who told us they could only have plasticine in their classrooms if it was used to mold letters. Play was literally a bad word. In 2012, the Council of Ministers of Education cited the psychological and neurological research to endorse a sustainable pedagogy for the future that does not separate play from learning, but brings them together to promote creativity in future generations. And there's other progress to be noted. Some jurisdictions have extended experiential learning approaches to children in grades two and three. Steps are being taken to raise the qualifications, compensation, and professional recognition of early childhood educators. Population-based assessments, such as the Early Development Instrument, are being used to support planning. And the public is being kept informed through regular reporting on investments and outcomes. In 2006, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development revealed that Canada had the lowest rate of spending, lowest rate of spending, on early childhood programs among all OECD countries. Not something to be proud of. Since then, the provinces have upped their contribution from 3.5 billion annually to 7.5 billion. Now this is only halfway to the 15 billion which would bring us in line with OECD recommendations. Nevertheless, the increase represents significant progress. We're also pleased to report that a review of 2013 provincial and territorial budgets showed all jurisdictions held the line or increased their spending for early education despite financial challenges. And that is good news. Increased spending has brought increased access. Over 52% of children aged two to four regularly attended an early education program in 2011, up from the 20% of children under age six identified by the OECD in 2006. Expanded access to school-operated programs accounts for most of the increases. Accountability for public investments has also improved. Most provinces determine children's readiness for school learning during kindergarten using the early development instrument. Kindergarten teachers use the EDI to assess children on scales related to their social, emotional, cognitive, and physical development. <clears throat> It is, in effect, a measure of how well children spent their earliest years. The EDI was a recommendation of the first early year study in 1999. Today, it is in use in most regions across Canada and has been adapted for international use. The latest results from Ontario will include the first cohort of children in full day four and five year old kindergarten. We understand there has been a drop in vulnerability that can be attributed to full day kindergarten. The Early Childhood Education Report 2011 is a snapshot of emerging childhood education systems. Five categories reflect the policy lessons that emerged from the OECD's review of the early education and care in its member states. <clears throat> the first category is governance, and it asks, is oversight for ECE split between multiple departments, or does it have coherent direction and sound service delivery? The second category is funding. Is it adequate to support program quality and reasonable access? Category three, access. Full day kindergarten is becoming the norm. Is it being offered? Do at least half of children two to four years regularly attend an ECE program? Is the accommodation of children with special needs a condition of public funding? The fourth category is learning environment. And here we look at the density of ECE qualifications 
and the professionalization of the workforce? Has the provincial curriculum been developed and are ECE salaries reflective of the value of the work? The last category, accountability. Are provinces meeting their reporting requirements? Is program quality assessed in all ECE settings? And is the EDI or similar tool used at entry to kindergarten? The benchmarks in each category were adapted to Canadian circumstances. The ECE report findings are actually positive. They reflect the progress that had been made across Canada since the dismantling of the federal provincial childcare agreements. In 2006, only three jurisdictions offered full day kindergarten. Today, seven do. Province wide curriculum anchored in learning through play was the exception rather than the norm. No province had merged oversight for education and childcare. Today, five provinces have combined their departments, and the monitoring and reporting of vulnerability using the EDI is no longer a rarity. Investments in early education and care have doubled still below the OECD average, but good progress, and over half of all children regularly attend preschool. There are many, many made in Canada examples of good practice and the steps jurisdictions took to achieve their results. Their experiences can serve as a guide to others. The report does not suggest that there is only one route to a comprehensive system. Prince Edward Island and Quebec reached their destinations using very different methods. Early education advocates can be rightly suspicious of schools for their rigidity and focus on a few narrow outcomes rather than looking at the whole child and the family. However, children spend the majority of their childhood in school and parents want their children to succeed. Schools can be a place where children both learn and be happy. The trend is towards locating early education programs in schools. It has been found that the presence of ECE programs benefits the school environment, making it more welcoming to children and families alike. And this is more likely to occur when schools are responsible for the ECE program, where ECE is not viewed a tenant in the school, but a first tier in learning and development. Excellent ECE programs do exist, but as excellent as they are, these programs are few and the number of families they serve is small. No jurisdiction anywhere provides preschool for the majority of children solely through the community sector. In asking education to take the lead, we are not denigrating the contributions of the family supported childcare sectors to children and families. Rather, we start from the considerable international evidence in choosing education as the base upon which to grow an early childhood system. Education is unambiguous. It is about children, all children, from this universal and well-established platform, we can develop a modern understanding that learning begins at birth, continues throughout life, and involves the whole family and the whole community. With education, there is no need to reinvent the wheel. Schools are in every neighborhood, not just some. And education already comes with a strong infrastructure, financing, training, curriculum, data collection, evaluation and research. The Accord on Early Learning and Early Childhood Education, which you will hear more about this afternoon at its official launch, reminds us that expanding education's mandate to include young children isn't about pushing academic demands down and abandoning the care and nurturance, which is the domain of early childhood education. Rather, it draws on research showing that incorporating early childhood education into schools can have a transformative impact, turning them into vibrant family centers that welcome children and families before, during, and after the school bell rings. Early education for all is not a utopian fantasy, particularly if it is built on the existing asset we have in public education, which everybody values. With less effort than starting a whole new social program from scratch, Education can expand to bridge the gap between parental leave and formal schooling. By including the option of extended day, year-round activities, Canada can have its long-demanded early learning and childcare program. I would like to conclude this morning 
by extending my congratulations to the Deans of Education of Canada for their accord on early learning. This wonderful resource was developed under the thoughtful direction of Deans Kimberly Franklin, James McNitch, and Ann Sherman. I heartily thank you for your efforts. To those of you working in the front lines of early education, programming, research, administration, and educator training, this is a great toolbox for action. It is certainly going to become a permanent fixture, fixture in my lexicon, my kit, and I thank you for that, and thank you for your attention today. done exactly what big, big thinking lecturers should do, which is to broaden our horizons and to make what seems impossible very possible in our minds, so thank you. You've also, I think, done what many of us in social sciences and humanities research try to do, which is to link the research that we do to important policy outcomes um, and in such an eloquent and uh, elegant fashion, and I think we have a lot of people in the room who would like to learn how to be able to do that in this way. Thank you so much. We have three mics. We have three mics that are up. Uh, please don't be shy, but we prefer that you go to the mics to ask your questions so that if there's a need for, trans uh, there need, need for translation, I don't know, but so that we have it on, um, on tape as well. I'd like to start while you guys are making your ways to the mic with my own question. Um, so as a, um, uh, a young mother, uh, uh, not so young now, but at one point a young mother, uh, in Quebec, uh, I realized that in my own personal journey, I would not be here speaking with you today if I hadn't had access to early childhood education. There so that's go. really, I think, for a lot of young professional women, this, is the, this, is, this was the key. This was the key that unlocked our future. Uh, that being said, I also have a special needs child, mm -hmm. and it was through the experience of early childhood education that we actually found out he had special needs. So I was wondering if you could speak to that as well. So it's not that parents aren't able to educate and to be part of childhood development and learning, but that sometimes uh, this added structure and this added support can also help in these kinds of situations. In as part of my dream, <laughs> when we get the perfect system, the high quality perfect system, I see it as a catchment mechanism with all children together so the children with special needs can be identified by well-educated uh, uh, teachers and professionals, ECE professionals. If they're educated in all the special needs, whether it's children that are going to be suffering abuse or uh, speech and language uh, deficits, uh, or, and the multitude of other learning uh, deficits that they might have. If you have them all together with a highly trained, caring team of professionals, my dream is that that's where they will be identified very early, be mm -hmm. before those deficits get under the skin. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. An added benefit. I still have the mics mm -hmm. uh, open here. I'd like to maybe ask, um, in terms of the interface, between education policy and social policy. Um, sometimes things like early childhood kind of fall behind, between the cracks. How were you able, so this is for the deans in the room, how were you able to convince the education milieu that this was a fight worth fighting? Or, so in, in other words, the impetus mm -hmm. for early childhood education, is it coming from the social sector more interested in health policy and child learning, the impact on child's health, or is it from uh, the education part of the equation? I've always felt that educators were there with us because I think they just innately knew, even before the science came out. <laughs> anybody teaching children knew, uh, basically, you know, I've been, this has been on my mind all my life, and now all of a sudden I've got an answer right. for it. So I've always felt that uh, education was there for us. Um, Carrie can speak more fulsomely about uh, the, ex the experiences blending teachers with ECEs and getting that, um, getting to respect each other. Uh, that has been maybe a more of a challenge than anything. Would you say, Carrie?
It has it, absolutely on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes unions get a little mm -hmm. bit in the way of blending the ECEs and the, but over time that'll happen. And I don't know if I dare say this or not, but uh, what'll take care of that is when, when unions include ECEs, we pay them the same as we do, uh, put them on the same scale, <laughs> on the pay scale, that'll take care of itself. Give them over. <laughs> I'm one of those people who can't stand it if there's silence and nobody comes up for a question. <laughs> but I do want to thank you so much. This was definitely worth giving up a Sunday morning for. And I'm wondering, will it be possible to have access to your PowerPoint, PowerPoint that gorgeous PowerPoint, by the way, and, and your notes? Would that be possible? Absolutely, yes. Um, so like your um, the person here, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. Um, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for early childhood education as well. Uh, I was living in France. My children were born in France. My husband unfortunately died when our children were oh. two and four. And if it hadn't been for the free, available preschool, um, you know, I'm not sure what would have been. Uh, and today my daughter's a doctor and uh, you know, my children are both very happy, positive, successful people. And I'm running a charitable organization that focuses on the first year of life on the early months. And I'd be delighted to give you some information if you think that could be helpful. And also, Alberta, we need to shake Alberta. <laughs> Thank you. We're moving west. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> um, yes, thank you for your wonderful talk. I was interested to know, um, I'm from California. We have very uh, severely limited funding and education. And um, we pride ourselves in being not 50th, but 49th, just above Mississippi. Um, so even though the model that you are going to build or, or are advocating for all of us to build um, works on existing assets, which makes sense, do you anticipate the need for some kind of entrepreneurial action or uh, funding? And if so, has the idea of social impact bonds been a part of the discourse for early childhood education where by proving that there's an economic outcome and in fact profit to educating the youngsters this way early on with high quality preschool, um, that we could therefore fund it by people investing in it who would expect a return because this is happening in some very progressive cities in the United States and I wasn't sure if Canada had social impact bonds and this seems like a perfect uh, subject to consider it. I think there is probably some room for entrepreneurial initiatives, but nothing good is going to happen until it moves into public policy and becomes available for all children, not just those we define as at risk. So yes, there is room for, the, for uh, some kind of entrepreneurial initiative, but it has to be under, I think, it, it, under the direction of uh, public policy and, and government, or nothing good is going to happen. None of your outcomes are really going to mean much until all children have access to early education. And as far as the economic impact is concerned, we have many different, we have made in Canada, there are also many made in the United States uh, economic studies that probably the best place to invest to stimulate the economy is in early years. And we need to begin by trying to get it, well, think of moving the education system downward, not that we want to put little children behind desks. It'll still look as if they're in a big childcare center playing, but it's play with purpose under the guidance of well-educated staff. I would think the Canadian government would be very interested in all of this then, because I, they could, I would think that the Canadian government would be very interested in funding this because they'll see great returns, and I wish you well with your work. We haven't been able to convince all levels yeah. <laughs> it's a work in progress. Yes. Thank you, Margaret, for a very, uh, very stimulating and, and thought-provoking talk. I, I cringe every time I see that slide that shows Canada at the bottom of the OECD countries in terms of its contributions to, to early childhood. And I'm wondering if you, uh, if, if you have any explanation for that? Because I do think we're a country that's filled with caring people, but somehow we've fallen off where the rest of the countries in the world are going in terms of caring for their youngest citizens. Do you, and, and how do we turn that about? You know, how do we, how do we get government to pay attention? I wish you could give me the answer. Uh, 
we were making progress, uh, but in 2006 it stopped. Was it 2006? Yeah. When the yeah. National Child Care Plan was canceled? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, how do you get that turn, the tap turned back on? Uh, I wish other people would give me the answer. What is, what is happening uh, across Canada, good things are happening in the provinces. And we have made progress in the last uh, six years. We really have made progress. So really what we're trying to do is to plant the seeds, plant the knowledge, work with public uh, policy, starting with the premiers, and it has to start with your, your, your lead politicians in every province. If we can build a foundation that is consistent across Canada, consistent uh, philosophy, not that they all get there in the, exactly the same way, but there are certain pieces that need to be in place. And so if, as long as, and we are making progress, and I'm happy about that, uh, so that when, if and when, and that day will happen, uh, we get the federal government buy-in. Hmm, we're going to take off. That's my dream. I'm, I'm going to ask a question from my chair, if that's okay. Uh, and I also wanted to tell people that uh, Margie does go with her staff from the McCain Foundation uh, and meets with every premier and has been going across the country and invites early childhood edu educators in New Brunswick. I go with her to meet with the premier and talk uh, with the Minister of Education as well. Uh, and that's why I think we're seeing some of the improvement we are but the stumbling block remains at the federal level, in my opinion. You, your slide in, indicated that they get 44 cents back to them that they don't ever return uh, to child care programs. And uh, you know, I, we've talked about this before, about the need for all of us to be on board uh, to create a strategy that can, uh, with the premiers and the ministers of education, uh, through CMAC, thing, groups like that, to really start to pressure the federal government. Uh, you know, it's always my hope that that, uh, uh, the last or second last place uh, uh, finish will be, uh, if nothing else, an embarrassment to them to start to think about uh, the need of children in Canada. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but I do think we really need to strategize across a number of layers. One, thing, one of the encouraging things is that, yes, we do have to work with, at the highest level, uh, politically and in public service. Uh, what we've done is, is fund research and demonstration sites. Mm -hmm. So we can take that information to premiers, to cabinet, and where the decisions are going to be made, and with the, with the departments of education. Um, one of the interesting things is that uh, we work with all, all stripes of government, c conservative, liberal, NDP, and in every case, we talk the same story. It's as if political stripes don't exist. Now, that's a, that's a good thing. But then governments change, and you see on the horizon, uh oh, oh, oh that, that government in, uh, well, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia are falling behind. So what we have to do, then we have to start educating the opposition leaders. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, we do, yeah. but you know, before Premier Allward was, it was Premier Sean Graham in New Brunswick that uh, initiated early years uh, uh, planning, and then he, he, we could see he was going to be defeated, so I'm sending emails to the leader of the opposition, David Allward, please, 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 please don't cancel the early years plans, please, <laughs> and start pleading, and he said, he sent me an email back, I won't cancel it. In fact, he made it better. And so now I have the Nova Scotia uh, liberal leader calling me, okay, you've got to get me up to speed here. <laughs> so, you know, good things are happening. We're making progress in all the provinces. Um, and of course, Quebec has just moved all their child care system into, the, into education, which is a, a big leap forward. Um, and, you know, they've made, all the provinces have made progress since we did the, the last ECE report. Isn't that right, Carrie? They've all made progress. Yeah. Now we're going to start strategies. We're uh, trying to find um, on the ground foundations in Manitoba and 
Saskatchewan, even in British Columbia, that could help us on the ground. You're, there, you're people that are on site. So that's a work in progress. It, it's a complex policy environment, but mm -hmm. it can happen. I often ask, is federalism good for your health? Now I'm thinking, is federalism good for our kids? Uh, but yeah. in, in effect, if you mm -hmm. can get through the complexity, and, and as you say, levels of government, but also foundations. So in mm -hmm. Quebec as well, NGOs have been enormously well, powerful. Well, Quebec is wonderful. We've got the Chagnon, Chagnon Foundation. Foundation, Foundation. Yeah. And, we, and so. we, have, we work with seven other foundations across Canada, mm -hmm. and Chagnon, and uh, yeah. a wonderful, wonderful relationship that we have. We sit around the table, and we talk big picture. Yeah. It's, it's, it's good. Huge impact. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the, uh, the speech. It was very interesting. Um, I'm involved since my kids were born with the parents' movement, and, um, and I'm French, so it's like with the Francophone educations and the Francophone um, parents' group. And in Ottawa, we have the uh, Commission Nationale des Parents Francophones that rein reigns uh, all the provinces and the territories that are uh, not Quebec. And you answered my question at the, on this last intervention because my point is in Ottawa where we have all the province with us and that we look at this same problem, like where do we hit, like where do we go or to get that same strategy and ask for the same, because it's like being French or English, it's the same problem. Mm -hmm. And we face, I think, on two levels, the education system where, you know, it's a lot easier if the parents are not too close for, for a lot of them, not all. But the parents also is kind of scared to, to go in and be involved. So you have these two things, mm -hmm. and then you have the early childhood versus the education, you know, the learning and to be at the desk and learn. So, and for the parents, sometimes it's not clear. Say, I don't want my kids to be scholarized, you know, like mm -hmm. to go to school at two years old. And so how do, or where do we go to figure out a way that we all speak the same language and we talk to the same person that has the power mm -hmm. to influence and to make change? Mm -hmm. Because we can be in our corner and talk and talk and talk and nothing happens. We have lots of example stories from, from single moms, challenged single moms, who uh, really felt like they were bad moms because they couldn't, just literally could not get their kids to all the different appointments and access all the interventions that, that are available. But once they got into one center and it was like a one-stop shop, they could, they, they, uh, then all of a sudden they felt that they could really be the good parent that they wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So like for the organizations, for the parents group, uh, the federations of parents, do we tell them to just go and knock on the doors of the ministers of social ministry or education ministry and just keep banging on the door? I, banging on the door. <laughs> The squeaky wheels get, get, the, get the grease. <laughs> yes, uh. keep knocking on the doors of ministers of education and premiers, and uh, yes. Well, thank you very much for your work and your dedication. Thanks. And bring a loudspeaker when you go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Madame McCain. I wanted to point out that your talk here today is co-sponsored uh, by three uh, exceptional partners, the Association of Canadian Deans of Education, uh, the Canada Foundation for Innovation, the Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada. And I think all three partners and, and the Federation itself are just thrilled that you were able to join us. Thank you very, very well, much. <laughs> I'd like to Thank ask, you. I'm just going to, on behalf, on behalf I, of the university. May I say thank you oh, to course. them yes. for sponsoring it? Yes. <laughs> that means a lot that you put me on the agenda and that you're there. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, the University of Victoria, uh, of course, were in their on their beautiful campus. They provided the simultaneous translation, and Ted has a little gift from, for oh. you from them. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. So Thank you. Oh, isn't that lovely? Oh. oh, wonderful. Beautiful book. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you, Thank you again, Madame McCain. So... 
someone mentioned the slides. You should know that all of these big thinking events are being videotaped and you can find them on the, uh, the Federation's website. Uh, we have another big thinking lecture coming up at noon, Ben, Le ben Levin. Tomorrow, Mary Ellen turpel Lafon. Uh, other exciting things happening throughout the week. Thank you for coming in such big numbers. Merci beaucoup et bon congrès.